Hey there, everyone, and welcome to the final bar. I'm Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist at StockCharts.com in a beautifully sunny Redmond, Washington. It's Thursday, April 18th. The market's continuing to feel very much in a distribution phase. The NASDAQ about a half a percent lower. Not end of the world kind of negativity, but certainly not any sort of positive rotation just yet. You're certainly seeing that continued movement away from previous growth leadership into some of the value-oriented sectors of the markets. Utilities, a very defensive sector, once again, bubbling to uh, the top of the leaderboard today. We have a really good guest today. Tyler Wood of Go No Go Charts is going to share with us their methodology, a sort of trend-following composite indicator and set of indicators really documenting this rotation in an interesting area of the market, which may be familiar. We've talked with a number of guests about uh, an interesting, actionable idea around here. So uh, make sure you uh, stay on for, uh, for Tyler's conversation here in a moment. Let's get to our market recap and focus on how the markets have evolved in this trading day. Before we get to the charts, we asked recently in a poll, is the next 10% move in the S&P 500 higher or lower? Look at this, two-thirds saying 10% lower, only one-third saying 10% higher. I actually have a chart here looking at the S&P 500 and what those 10% moves may actually look like. Whoops. So here, if you look, you can see a 10% move to the upside would get us just about 5,500. That'd be 5,518. Of course, that would take us well past previous all-time highs, which are about 5% above current levels and get us all the way up to a new all-time high, 5,500. So the question is, do we make a new high before we get all the way down to almost 4,500? And indeed, a 10% drop beyond today's close would take us below the 200-day moving average for the first time since the October low. It would also take us down in the range of the July-August peak from last year. That's a pretty big drawdown, but certainly seems for most of us that seems more likely than a 10% gain in making new highs. I would wholeheartedly agree, and I would say in general, before you would have any sort of move above 52, 53, and even 5,500, you have to see a dramatic improvement in some of the growth leadership names because those dominate our cap-weighted benchmarks. So for now, I would agree. I, I think I would side with Final Bar Nation and 10, uh, say 10% lower. By the way, don't forget to follow us on all your social uh, media accounts to make sure that you don't miss the next poll as well. Getting to our market recap here, you can see the Dow actually finishing gently in the positive, just barely. The S&P 500 about a quarter of a percent lower. We remained above that 5,000 level. For a while there earlier in the day, we did just barely get back above 50-50. Now, I didn't have an alert set on this, but I was certainly watching the market as we sort of gained right out of the open. Uh, but at the end of the day, of course, we rotate right back lower. And so, you know, again, just in the short term, you can see a number of times here in the last couple of days where we've had some spikes that have been sold, right? That initial bounce, which are some buyers pushing prices higher, sort of evaporating. There's no sustained uh, buying power that's coming into this market. Uh, people are, are treating short-term bounces as an opportunity to shed more uh, shares or raise more cash, however you want to think about it. But I think the short-term movements over the last couple of days really tell the story of the sentiment here day to day in the markets. The NASDAQ Composite, the worst performer here on our front page, down about half a percent to 15,600. The S&P mid cap and small cap uh, index is essentially unchanged. The mid cap index was slightly lower and the small cap index was actually just barely higher, just above the, uh, the zero line. The VIX uh, a little bit lower, around 18. We're sort of in that, I guess, no man's land, for lack of a better term, between 15 and 20. A VIX below 15 is a low volatility bullish uh, reading, in my opinion. A VIX between 15 and 20 is your pullback range. A VIX above 20 is a uh, kind of a danger sign. We're not there yet, but that's what I would be concerned about and be looking for uh, on the chart of the VIX. Looking at the interest rate environment, you can see the 10-year yield uh, and 30-year yield and 5-year yield all higher today. So the 10-year point around 465, the long bond yield around 475. Bond prices, of course, moving uh, slightly lower. The TLT was down about half a percent. Dollar index uh, up slightly from yesterday's close. You know, if you think about the implications of rising rates, one of the articles I saw uh, earlier today, just trying to make sense of the, uh, the markets, talked about how uh, home sales struggling because, you know, again, it's just expensive to buy a home. That is the challenge with higher rates. That is why the Fed has been raising rates and keeping rates elevated, literally to slow down the economy and bring inflation into check. Unfortunately, what that means is if you want to borrow money to buy a house or a car or start a small business, it's a lot more expensive than it was a couple of years ago. And so I think consumers certainly feeling the pain as we go through Q2 earnings here uh, this week and next week and uh, a little bit more. 
uh, I think you'll see more and more companies sort of recognizing the, uh, the challenges of a higher rate environment. Certainly any company that's in a growth phase uh, is probably trying to borrow money, so it's not getting cheaper for them as well. Gold and silver prices higher. Silver really flat for the day. Gold moving up about a third of a percent, and the uh, DBC, which is a broad commodity ETF, uh, about flat from yesterday's close. Looking at cryptocurrencies, a bit of life uh, breathed into the, uh, the Bitcoin chart. Bitcoin again recently tested the 60,000 level, now sort of rotating higher through the course of the day. And even though stocks were selling off through today's session, certainly in the afternoon, you see Bitcoin actually rallying through the course of, uh, of today's trading, uh, currently trading around 63,450, we'll call it. Ether price is around 3070, and both of those are up from yesterday's close. Looking at the 11 S&P sectors, utilities once again in the leaderboard. And, you know, the market can rally with utilities at the top of the list, but it's kind of one of those things. When utilities are the best performing sector, that's not juicy, it's not sexy, it's very low volatility. You kind of own utilities if you don't want to own something else. It's traditionally quite a defensive play. And so when utilities are at the top of the list, it just certainly feels defensive to me. Consumer staples were number three, which is another fairly uh, defensive sector as well. Consumer staples have not been at the top of the leaderboard very often recently. Communication services, number two, right there in the middle. Uh, about half of the uh, S&P sectors were down today. Technology leading the way lower, down 1.1%, followed by consumer discretionary and then industrials. Looking at our market trend model, as a reminder, we remain bearish on the short term uh, for all of the major equity averages. This is my market trend model that I've referred to randomly uh, on, the, uh, on the show. Uh, we have a new widget on our dashboard called the Keller Market Model, which basically just has a quick visual representation. This is version one. We'll do some enhancements to it uh, over time, but it's just a quick visual cue to tell you, uh, based on that trend following model using weekly data updated on Fridays, uh, what the trend is. Short-term trend certainly feels negative looking at the charts and the model uh, very much reflecting that. The medium-term and long-term trend is still positive, and I think that's uh, how, uh, how the market feels as well. Looking at the Magnificent Seven and Friends, and thanks, by the way, I've uh, asked you to come up with a better name than Fab Four. We have the Four Horsemen, which I kind of like. Um, Four Horsemen of the Stock Apocalypse uh, is a little wordy, but I like where you're at. Um, keep the ideas coming. Let me know if you have any better ideas about those four leading names that still are probably the strongest of this group of, uh, of eight stocks. But for the record, a couple of these were actually positive. Meta up 1.5% today, Alphabet slightly higher, NVIDIA up as well. NVIDIA is an interesting one. It ended up being kind of a doji candle today, kind of a choppy candle. NVIDIA has been testing that 850 level for quite some time. Today, we get sort of a doji candle where the open and close are level, and we're right at that support level. Look to the left on the chart, and you can see all those times when we've tested that uh, support around 840 to 850. We're there today with a... Uh, sort of uh, a candle pattern marking indecision. On the downside, Tesla continuing to not be a great chart. I've had so many questions about, is now the time to buy Tesla? Is now the time to buy Tesla? And I'm, I'm thinking back to Walter Deemer, a famous technical analyst who was at Putnam Investments in the 1970s and 80s, and he famously said when a portfolio manager kept coming into his office in 1973 to 1974, he said, the time to buy is when you won't want to. When you stop coming in my office and asking me, that's when you probably want to buy. Tesla is still in a downtrend, right? And so lower highs and lower lows are the mark of a stock that's vulnerable. It's a mark of a stock in a distribution phase. There's a lack of buying power. There aren't investors coming in thrilled to buy Tesla on weakness. There's continued distribution. I get excited about a chart like Tesla when we stop making new lows. When we try to make a new low and fail to do so, that's where the chart like that uh, becomes uh, interesting. Tesla now down to 150. Microsoft and Amazon, two of those leading names, by the way, uh, down as well. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500, sort of check in on where things uh, are at. As you can see, we've uh, broken down through 50-50. Earlier today, I had my pencil sharpened. I'm ready to start writing something to somebody about how we're back above and didn't follow through from yesterday's first close below 50-50. But by the end of the day, we actually made a slightly lower close. So I would consider this a nice follow through to yesterday's breakdown. So we've traded down through the 50 day moving average, now down through 50 50, which I consider a line in the sand, and now kind of making a continued a downward pressure. I think it, this is that point, as I've alluded to, when you start failing to hold a line in the sand, that's when you have to start thinking about potential downside targets and what they might represent. I would certainly be thinking about some uh, downside objectives and you know, what some uh, negative scenarios might look like. 
Um, remember, uh, investing is not about predicting the future. It's not about knowing what's to come. None of us do. It's all about probabilities. It's all about what we think is the most likely scenario and then placing bets in line with that, but also recognizing that there are alternate scenarios. We don't necessarily know what's going to happen. So thinking about what a 10% move, 5%, 10% move higher, a 5%, 10% move lower might mean for your portfolio, how you would manage risk, how you would uh, you know, unwind the positions that are starting to struggle, making sure you have good money management uh, into play, I think makes sense. I'm already sort of immediately looking down to that 4,700 level. That's the 200-day moving average. Maybe we retest that, which is what essentially happened after the July peak of last year. A lot of similarities, sort of echoes between what we saw in July and that three-month decline and what we've seen so far in this initial breakdown uh, in terms of a break of the 50-day. Note here that we actually broke back slightly above the 50-day before continuing the next leg lower. So there can certainly be some upswings during that period, but the momentum certainly looking a lot similar to sort of that mid-August period. Not a great sign for uh, the S&P overall. I wrote an article earlier for uh, CNBC Pro where I'm a contributor, and one of the things we talked about was the bullish percent index. And I'd point out the uh, bullish percent index. We've talked about this, uh, this chart before on the show. It's a breadth indicator based on uh, point and figure charts, uh, classic methodology really based on uh, trend and trend breakouts, really momentum shifts when stocks are making new swing highs and new swing lows, sort of turns that into a, uh, a simple charting uh, technique using X's and O's. This is a percentage of how many S&P 500 members are currently showing a bullish signal. Right now, it's a, it's a coin flip. If you bring up an S&P 500 stock, it's equal chance that it's in an uptrend or a downtrend. That's down from around 80%. Uh, back here at the end of last year. That's down from around 70% just a couple weeks ago at the beginning of April. Now we're all the way down to 50%. Here's the real kicker, though. If you look at the bullish percent index on the NASDAQ 100, it's already below 30. So while the S&P's bullish percent index has kind of been up here, the NASDAQ's bullish percent index has been going down dramatically. It was around 90%. Uh, right around the Christmas time frame, Christmas, New Year's. Now, all of a sudden, it's down below 30%. So most NASDAQ 100 members are in a bearish point and figure chart. That shows you the dom or the rotation away from those growth leadership names. Now, just because it's down below 30 is not on its own a buy signal. I've highlighted it in green, but I would point out that when it comes out of that region, when it breaks back above 30, that's the sign that whatever distribution you are observing is probably near its end point. So for now, I would say this is really just driving home the fact that growth is in a rotation. Uh, it's certainly deteriorating as a, as a leadership role. I'm looking elsewhere for opportunities. When I scan for stocks making new swing highs, I'm not seeing a lot of growth sectors very well represented. It's other parts of the market. Let's look through some of the individual names. We've got a lot of earnings going on here. We don't have time, of course, to go through all of the charts, but I just want to highlight some of those that are moving related to their earnings report. Las Vegas Sands is in the gambling group within the consumer discretionary sector. They reported yesterday, I think right after the close, you can see the gap down today, finished down almost 9%. What's interesting about the chart of LVS is that gap lower really completes the breakdown of the 200-day moving average, also brings this previous support level into uh, play. So I'm actually kind of intrigued about this chart, sort of getting down to that 44 range as it's becoming oversold. Stocks becoming oversold as they're testing previous resistance, that can sometimes be a really compelling point. So I think thinking about that level and looking for a potential rotation higher certainly is how I would be thinking of the chart of uh, LVS. My guest yesterday, Danielle Shea of uh, Options, um, uh, excuse me, Options Strategist at uh, Simpler Trading. And if you missed that one, go back. We, we had a really good discussion about some of those growth leadership names and the rotation that we've seen. She was mentioning Taiwan Semiconductor's earnings, which were uh, before the open today. You can see the Taiwan Semiconductor gapping below its 50-day moving average. That's the first time it's below it since early November, and that's gapping uh, below the uh, previous swing low. So this was kind of that point where a chart like TSM either finds support at an ascending 50-day moving average, the RSI uh, bottoms out around 40, and we get this nice buyable dip. That would be a really good sign for semiconductors. We saw the opposite. We actually saw the stock gap lower Gap below the 50-day, the RSI now slightly below 40. And that's sort of a negative outcome for a key semiconductor name. So for this week, that's the earnings you want to pay attention to for semiconductors. Not a good sign for Taiwan Semiconductor. Certainly not a good implication for uh, semiconductors in general, the SMH or the SOX. BX is Blackstone, getting into the financial sector. Two stocks we can, uh, we'll get to here. 
Uh, Blackstone, obviously, sort of a financial conglomerate, but it's bucketed uh, under uh, asset managers here. Uh, you can see, again, a break below the 50-day moving average. They reported before the open today. It wasn't a horrible day, down just over 2%. But again, this is a name breaking below support. The RSI kind of right at that moment of truth, and it's failing, right? Look back here in January. We pulled back to a 50-day moving average and popped higher. The RSI went right down to 40 and pushed up. That's what you're sort of looking at here. It's not happening. The 50-day moving average is not holding. We're breaking below. RSI 40 appears to be breaking here. And so I think this is also a vulnerable name. After essentially making a triple top pattern, right? You have a test of 130 to 132 a number of times here in the last uh, couple months before now rotating to the downside. Key Bank, uh, pretty popular, uh, pretty uh, widespread here in the Seattle area. Also Cleveland, where I grew up, uh, where we have the, uh, had the key, uh, key Bank building. You can see here, again, this is a common theme with a lot of these names. As we've talked about, right, one of the negative, I think, outcomes right here, one of the bearish takeaways on a week like this is if stocks like Key are unable to hold an ascending 50-day moving average. And I would say it's not end of the world just yet. You can see back here, like in February, we sort of traded around the 50. We kind of broke down, but never really followed through. We're kind of in that similar uh, sort of phase. The RSI for now is holding around 40. So it's kind of right at that point. So if you think about it, um, you know, we're right at that moment of truth. Do we hold it or not? And I, I'm skeptical of names like this uh, that are unable to, uh, to hold support. But for now, we're kind of right around that swing low from March after making a new high. I still think this is OK until we break below 14. And then all of a sudden, that's a pretty, uh, pretty ugly chart. Alaska Air Group, uh, certainly popular here in the Seattle area, biggest carrier at uh, SeaTac ALK. Uh, it's interesting. You've actually seen some interesting breaks higher on uh, airlines. We had United Airlines earlier this week, following through another 5.5% uh, to the upside. Alaska Airlines uh, popping uh, higher as well, above $44 a share today. This is actually a really compelling development, right? You look at this pattern here. I call that a coil pattern, right? Sort of bounce off of the October low. We then have this narrowing of the range, lower highs, higher lows. We break out of that pattern to the upside as we break above the 200-day moving average. Then look at what happens next. We pop up to 44. We pull back and essentially test the 200-day moving average from above. The RSI bottoms out around 50, and now we're popping higher. Pretty good setup going into uh, earnings uh, before the open today and a nice upside follow-through. Seems like airlines are actually starting to show some, uh, some signs of improvement. That brings us to Netflix. Netflix is actually reporting earnings today after the close. My question, as we've reiterated a number of times, does a stock like this hold the 50-day? If Netflix can't hold its 50-day, I would say the chances of this market going higher at this point are minimal. Names like this that are still trending higher but start to rotate lower, that really seals the deal for, I think, the S&P uh, 500 in a major pullback or corrective phase. Folks, that's our market recap for today. I want to bring on today's guest, Tyler Wood of Go No Go Charts here in a moment. Before we get to my conversation with Tyler, a couple quick announcements. First off, we so much love hearing from you. Appreciate all your support as we've uh, gone to 100,000 subscribers and, uh, and much more. We actually just got our plaque from YouTube uh, here in the Stock Charts office. Keep your questions coming. We'd love to uh, answer your question in our next mailbag show. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is our email. We're on X at Final Bar SCTV, so follow us there. And here on YouTube, just drop a comment below the video that you're watching. We'll hope to answer your question in our next mailbag show. Also, I will be doing a webcast coming up next Tuesday, April 23rd, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, called Breaking Down Breath. If what I told you about the bullish percent indexes was at all intriguing, I hope you will join me for this free event next Tuesday. We'll be going through a series of breath indicators, why they're important, how they relate to one another, what they're telling us about the market conditions now versus previous major market tops. To sign up for that event, go to marketmisbehavior.com slash breadth. I want to bring on today's guest, Tyler Wood. Tyler's the co-founder of Go No Go Charts, coming to us from upstate New York. Tyler, welcome to the show. It's been a little while, but I'm super excited to hear, uh, hear your perspective. How are things going your way these days? Ab absolutely great, Dave. Thanks so much for having me on. It's good to uh, good to see you again. We had a sharp mean reversion upstate New York. It was uh, it was <laughs> spring yesterday, and we're back to winter today. But uh, everybody's and, doing well. And the last time you and I saw each other was at the CMT event in Dubai, which is again just a memorable uh, moment with a lot of really good context from around the world. So good to reconnect with you and uh, and remember some of those moments. Let's get to some of the charts that are top of mind for you. I know you and Alex Cole do a great job at Go No Go of 
trying to just quantify momentum and how that's shifting. It seems like we have a shift of sorts in the S&P. Using your chart of the S&P, how do you interpret uh, the last couple of weeks here? Absolutely, Dave. Uh, we're not seeing anything different from uh, a lot of the analysts out there, but uh, our trend model is showing that we've left the uh, the go conditions. If we were to use nomenclature from you know launching a rocket ship, uh, you want the probabilities to be on your side. You want all the conditions to be optimal. And so in our trend model, when those bars are blue and aqua, we're in a go trend. It's uh, it's trending higher, series of higher highs and higher lows. And that trend has been amazing. Uh, we've we've seen uh, significant gains in the S and P five hundred, but that weakness and that pullback that we saw uh, this week has turned uh, the tables on the trend conditions. And you see it rotate uh, from those strong blue go conditions to aqua, then into amber. And so we've built into the model a, a sense of neutrality. Markets can go up, down, or sideways. Uh, so when they're in neutral conditions, when all of those blended indicators in the background. Uh, fall to their neutral position. That's an amber bar of uncertainty. And then we rolled over into pink and now strengthening to purple no-go bars. So our trend model is suggesting that at least in the near term, the S&P 500 is, uh, is heading in a downward direction. Uh, but I'd draw your eye, Dave, to that lower panel where we also built a model using a lot of different momentum indicators. Uh, we, we built a, a simple oscillator that moves from negative six to positive six. So it's a range bound oscillator. Um, and we also incorporated volume into that study. So when we're in the green color, uh, it's lighter relative volume. But when we see volume pick up, when there's a lot of enthusiasm from market participants, that uh, that line goes to a dark blue. So the other piece that uh, I think really stands out for Alex and I is uh, in a trend following system, you want to find areas where momentum is resurging in the direction of the underlying trend. Uh, folks like Connie Brown and Andrew Cardwell and others uh, did a lot of work on those momentum indicators and using them in a trending security. So if you look at the S&P 500 since November, we've been in that go trend and our momentum oscillator has stayed in positive territory, mm. surging higher into overbought regions and then coming back down to this amber uh, zero line. And that's our neutral level for momentum readings. And where it finds support, that, that gives us a buyable dip. That's a healthy pullback within an uptrend. What was different this time, Dave, was that we broke below the zero line and then came back to retest from below, couldn't get back into positive momentum territory, and then took off uh, with higher relative volume to the downside. So now we're sitting at a uh, at an area of oversold, and uh, the, the day has just concluded here on Thursday the 18th, but uh, we'll see where this goes from here. So overall, right, we've gone from a go, which has been, I mean, just remarkably strong from November all the way through, you know, into the last week. Now we go to go no go, right? Sort of so mm -hmm. indicating risk off. So does that mean in your perspective, we go from a risk on to risk off mentality or how do you sort of interpret that transition? Is that an excuse to unwind, get defensive or how do you sort of you know, take action relative to those kind of signals? Yeah, great question. So the way I learned it in the CMT program and from, uh, from great analysts and investors is that you need to have a process or a rules-based yeah. approach. And so if we started with a checklist of multiple technical indicators, right? Uh, shorter term moving averages, moving below longer term, or price breaking a moving average, or breaking a significant trend line. There are lots of things that you can put in your checklist. What I found challenging for myself was the analysis paralysis that a crowded chart produces. So I like to see price action really, really clean, but keep all of the weight of the evidence, if you will, all of that information from those amazing technical indicators that we all get to enjoy, and just blend that in the background. So to each his own, it uh, depends on an investor's time horizon. So if we were to look at this on a weekly basis, Dave, we'd see that we're still in a go trend on a mm. weekly time frame. If we're looking at this uh, in a uh, intraday time frame, that no-go condition would have appeared much earlier uh, than we're seeing here on the daily chart. So if you set your, your execution time frame, and actually the great John Bollinger taught us this in Dubai, if your execution time frame, let's say, is on the daily, uh, moving into a no-go condition, would be time to lighten up positions or close them out entirely. When I when I think about the index level, that's just equities broadly. Uh, I think mm. most of the folks watching this show are probably working with ETFs or single securities in a slightly more concentrated manner. But the overall market condition is telling us that we're, we're trending downward on this daily timeframe. So what that tells me is that I can't predict the future, but if I wanna react responsibly to what's uh, right in front of me, 
an allocation decision tells me that maybe equities aren't uh, aren't the strongest move right now. Mm. And for me, simplifying the trade decision is it's crucial, which is why these charts really help me avoid that analysis paralysis. It's great color there. And I, I find that having that sense of the primary trend, it's just that simple analysis. We, we don't necessarily want to be predicting the future. Let's just gather the evidence about what the conditions are right now. I think you guys do a, a fantastic job of that. Now, you obviously run these sorts of models on a lot of different asset classes, a lot of different things. We're actually previewing, I think, a, a plugin hopefully coming soon to stock charts users near you. Talk us Absolutely. through this heat map, and I can tell a general sense of hot to cold. Is that what we're looking at here? Cold to hot. So, uh, cold to hot, the, okay. The, the title I'd give this is Rocks Over Stocks, Dave. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a new trend, and yeah, that rotation is really clear. So, what we're doing here is taking that trend model the colors of the trend conditions, stripping away the price action, but we're looking at the trend itself. And in each of these panels, we've got a commodity relative to the S&P 500. Uh, Top panel is copper. Uh, we've got some oil. We've got uh, some agricultural commodities, corn, soybeans. We've got mixed bags. Uh, and we get into precious metals, industrial metals, mining, lumber, nat gas, you name it. And so as we started this year, Equities are outperforming commodities. And we saw a lot of pinks and purples in this relative ratio chart. Uh, and on that heat map, it doesn't look like commodities are, are really the play. And now we move into uh, the latter half of March and certainly accelerating into April. All of those conditions, uh, primarily for uh, energy and for mining and minerals, uh, we've seen that roll over where the outperformance, the alpha is being generated in commodities relative to equities. Mm, interesting. That makes a ton of sense. And you're picking up on that rotation away from kind of the growthy previous leadership to maybe some new leadership in the commodity mm -hmm. space. To, to finish up here, Tyler, you have an individual name, I think, that fits into this larger theme. We're looking at uh, Harmony Gold Mining. Talk us through this one in particular. Yeah, it's a $6 billion market cap. Uh, we, we've been keeping an eye on this as the trend continued. And the point that I'd want to make on this chart Everybody has seen the move in gold, and maybe not everybody feels comfortable trading futures and you want a, an equity way to express uh, that opinion about uh, gold. And certainly the gold miners have been kind of the higher beta play in uh, in that gold trade. And what's uh, striking to us on this, and we do use a lot of stock chart scans to uh, to find these opportunities, where you see the, the trend take off here in March, fresh go trend. Momentum is strong in the gonna go oscillator in the lower panel. We move to overbought extremes, and then we come back to test that zero line, finding support. And we've just done that again this week, where you see trend surging to the upside. And then we've got these counter trend pullbacks, which are very healthy. Uh, but we want to see and be objective or quantify when there is indeed a viable dip. And what we, what we got uh, earlier this week was a touch of the zero line with that oscillator, momentum went neutral, and now it's surging back positive. We're in uh, a level two positive momentum on heavy relative volume as, uh, as, this, as this trend accelerates for Harmony Gold Mining. Interesting. And I'm going to interpret the icons without asking, but I think I got this yeah. right. So, right, the red arrows were at an overbought extreme, right? Uh, the, we touched the zero line. We have a green circle, basically, meaning we've pulled back to that viable dip. And then October low, we have a green arrow. We got down to the oversold extreme. Is that generally how we're interpreting that? You are very astute, sir. Uh, Not yes, my first using... chart, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> Not your first chart. Using momentum in its traditional sense, we look for areas of overbought and oversold extremes yeah. and those counter trend correction icons. Let's just say you're a, you know, you're holding a diversified portfolio. You want to move money out of one security to take advantage of a new trend. Those are logical spots for a, a short-term peak in price. Price might struggle to move higher after an overbought condition. It's not a sell signal. Similarly, that oversold condition, that might be a chance to uh, lighten up short positions if you're trading uh, to the downside uh, or, uh, or to take some profits off the table. Just to finish up here, we have about a minute left, Tyler, but as you know, thinking back to the chart of the S&P, obviously rotating from go no to no-go, I'm curious with some of those leading growth names, things like Meta, Amazon, and others, those have been the names that are still kind of holding up. Based on your methodology, are those still places that are showing enough strength, or are we starting to see deterioration in some of those previous leadership names we should be concerned? 
You know, from a breadth standpoint, uh, we do run a lot of uh, scans and screening, and uh, we're actually going to have some go no go breath studies coming out soon. But uh, in in our work, Alex and I are finding less and less of these uh, new go trends, less and less of the securities that we had seen who were trending higher are holding those positions, and we're we're finding breaks of the zero line from the momentum oscillator. Regarding large cap tech, uh, definitely holding up better than small cap tech. Mm. Uh, and and uh, what we've seen with NVIDIA is really a uh, an inflection point uh, where we're, we're looking for support at the zero line before uh, we could make any conclusions about whether that trend will continue to be healthy. Uh, but from our perspective, using this relative strength idea around all of the sectors and then the industry groups within uh, is kind of our top down approach. Uh, so we look at both absolute and relative trends on everything and just use this uh, trend model to kind of simplify and clean up our charts. Tyler, this was awesome. Thanks for giving us some perspective. Interesting to see how you're applying the toolkit with sort of a rotational environment. I hope we can do this again sometime. Absolutely, Dave. Thanks so much for having me. I'll see yeah. you soon. Take care, Tyler. Thank you. That's no Tyler bad. Wood, folks. Tyler's a co-founder of Go No Go Charts coming to us from upstate New York. By the way, those are ACP plugins he was featuring, created by the guys at uh, Go No Go, uh, Tyler and uh, Alex Cole as well. To get to those on ACP in the bottom right corner, there's a little plug icon. You can click on that and find more information about the Go No Go plugins, including that relative strength heat map one. I'm actually pretty interested to use myself, so hopefully that we can get that going uh, very, very soon. Great take there by Tyler Wood at Go No Go Charts. Folks, that'll wrap the show today. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. A special thank you to Tyler Wood of Go No Go Charts joining us from New York. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.